Welcome to Experimental, the science show that tortures redheads, drinks too much, and revels in the science of falling cats. Later on, we'll be making the world's most boring experiment fun and asking Tango here to write her name. Get this piece of chalk and write your name. Come on, Tango, write your name. But first, let's be nasty to redheads. This is Dr Geoffrey Mogul. See, it says so on the door. And he studies redheads. That's redhead mice. And redhead humans. Why? Because he wants to find out how they react to pain. Which is fair enough, as he's the E.P. Taylor Professor of Pain Studies at McGill University. It is definitely not the case that I woke up one day and said, boy, I wonder if hair colour has anything to do with pain. Professor Mogul's interest in redheads started with these little chaps, red-headed mice. His team was studying the mice's sensitivity to a pain-killing drug, and his research for the gene responsible led him to a chromosome called mouse chromosome 8, which contains a gene which causes red hair. Not only did the gene make for ginger mice, but it made for mice that appear to feel less pain than their white or brown relatives. Amazingly, the mouse redhead gene is exactly the same gene as the one that causes gingers in the human population. <laughs> We tested the redhead mice for pain sensitivity on a bunch of different tests of pain in the mouse. We found that in every test, the redheaded mice were less sensitive to pain than the controls. And then we predicted that, therefore, human redheads should be less sensitive to pain than blondes and brunettes. To try and find out, he enlisted the help of his colleagues to carry out extra research. But what is pain, and why is it useful? The answer is simple. Without pain, nothing would stop you doing this. But with pain, no thinking is involved. It's just an instant response to get you out of danger. Pain is an important uh, warning function. Obviously, if you uh, sprain your ankle or, or break your leg, the pain is there to punish you if you try to move, right? Because your leg would rather you stay still for a few days and so it can heal properly. But how can you prove that redheads really do feel less pain than blondes or brunettes? Well, you hurt them, of course. Take a redhead and a non-redhead, make sure they know exactly what they're getting themselves into. This is John. He's going to be a witness just to prove that I didn't force you to sign the consent forms. OK, so if you're ready. And as soon as they've signed up, you strap them down and burn them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to apply this thermode to your forearm, and the temperature is going to rise. I'd like you to push the button when pain becomes intolerable, so you can no longer tolerate the heat. OK. OK, here we go. Like that wasn't enough, here comes a pressure test. By gripping a handle whilst her upper arm is squeezed by a blood pressure cuff, it impairs the circulation and... that hurts. I don't think I can go for much longer. OK, easy. <laughs> OK, it hurts. Thank you. The results prove that redheads really did feel less pain than their mousy blonde friends. But why? When the body is hurt, the brain produces powerful pain-killing chemicals called endorphins. But, just to make sure you feel pain enough to learn your lesson, the brain reduces the effect of endorphin. However, 
it seems that the redhead brain, with its altered gene, doesn't reduce the endorphins. So redheads feel less pain. But before all you redhead men go out and test your newfound mouse gene pain tolerance in some immature scrap, be warned. If the big blonde bloke decides to split your head in two, you'll be dead, whether you felt it or not. In a moment, a great film that just might make you want to... <sighs> but first, let's go testing in the test department. How strong is an egg? Well, it depends which way you try and break it. Squeeze it across the way and it's not very strong. But squeeze it end to end and the human hand can't crack it. So let's see how strong an egg really is in a kind of scientific way with our revolutionary Egg Tester 3000 machine. On the left, a crossways crush. And on the right, we're going to do it end to end. Well, at two kilos, things are fine. But, oh, it's a splat on the side of egg at three kilos. But how much longer can we go with the end-to-end -end crush? Fantastic! Nine kilos and we're still stacking. Why? Well, end-on, the egg works exactly the same way as a dough, with all the force being sent downwards through the line of the roof. This makes it one of the strongest shapes in nature. But even the strongest shape cannot beat the Egg Tester 3000 machine. And our end-to-end -end egg goes splat at 10 kilos. Coming later on Experimental, we find out why popcorn pops, why some horses are left-handed, and we meet the inventor of the beer mat that keeps you drinking. But first, let's see if you can watch this without yawning. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Full of carriers. Carriers of the most contagious thing in the world. Ebola. The cold. Avian flu. A yawn. Yes. <sighs> yawning. It's one of the most contagious things in the world. How do we know? Well, it's partly because of this man's research, Dr. Stephen Playtech. Drexel University's Yawn King. Contagious yawning is a phenomenon that is very well known. Um, if you talk to somebody on the street about contagious yawning, they've heard of this phenomenon. And what we've discovered is that between 40 and 60% of people who view, hear, read about, write about, or listen to somebody yawn actually experience the feeling of having a yawn themselves automatically, without thought. That's right. It's not just watching someone close to you yawning that sets you off. Oh. It's just as effective when it comes out of the television or even the radio. Amazingly, even reading about someone yawning is enough to set some people off. But why? The reason why we yawn in the first place is unknown. In fact, no one really knows why yawns exist. Until about 20 years ago, it was thought that yawning was a way of getting more oxygen into the blood when CO2 levels became too high. Indeed, the contagious effect of yawning was put down to there being a general drop in the oxygen level of a stuffy room. So everyone needed a good yawn to top themselves up. It sounded good until scientists discovered that there was no relationship between yawning and oxygen levels. And that's the way it remains today. Well, we may not know why we yawn in the first place, but Dr Playtech and his team think they've gone quite a way towards discovering why yawning catches using what is quite possibly the most boring experimental setup ever devised. Dr. Playtech had test subjects sit in the psychological test room and watch half-hour videos of people yawning. Mind you, he didn't exactly have an exciting time either. He had to wait behind a one-way mirror and count the number of times each of his subjects yawned. 
<sighs> After exhausting research, he found out that yawning is more contagious for some people than others. People who score higher on theory of mind or experience more empathy than other individuals tended to be more susceptible to the contagious yawning effect, meaning that if they were more empathic, they tended to show more contagious yawning. Theory of mind is what psychologists call the ability to put yourself in someone else's place, to empathize with their point of view, to mentally become them, and as a result, take on some of their traits. Which is why if they yawn, so will you. I expect that people watching this show, 60% of them will yawn at least once during this program, and then some of those will even, even yawn more, four, five, six, seven times even. Those are probably the highly empathic individuals that are watching the program. Other studies have shown that contagious yawning is a learnt response. Children under the age of five don't yawn when shown videotapes of other people yawning. And children younger than about six will not yawn when reading about yawning. Contagious yawning may be a primitive mechanism or a primitive process related to empathy or social behavior and social learning among group living animals. In other words, contagious yawning is really about synchronizing your mind with someone else's. So don't be insulted next time someone yawns in your face. They're not telling you you're boring. They're telling you that they empathize with you and understand your point of view. In a moment, Experimental goes to the races in Ireland and to a bar in Germany. But before all that excitement, a rather sombre piece on feline mortality. Experimental would like to present some reassuring work for cat owners living in high-rise buildings, carried out by eminent New York vets Hello. W. O. Whitney Hi. and C. J. Mella. <laughs> they looked at the mortality rates of cats who have fallen between 2 and 32 storeys. First, the good news. 90% survived. But there was something odd. The most likely floor from which a cat would suffer serious injury or death was not the 32nd floor, but the seventh. And the reason, the authors speculate, is this. As a cat accelerates, it stiffens up. It takes a drop of around seven storeys for the cat to reach its terminal velocity of around 100 kilometers per hour. Whereupon, the cat stops accelerating, feels no force acting upon it, and relaxes, increasing its surface area and flexibility. And hence, the area over which the deceleration provided by the ground is dissipated. Another one lives. Result, more cats live with longer drops. Still to come, the self-ordering beer mat. And a day at the races. First, let's eat at the test department. When his stomach rumbles, there's only one food a test department tester will eat. Popcorn. But with a planet-sized brain, the day had to come when the tester would wonder not how fast he can eat it, but what makes popcorn pop. Hmm. In other words, how does it turn from this into this? For the average punter, the answer, cooking in oil, might suffice. But not in the test department. We want to know exactly why they're flying out of the pan. So we got out the 1,000 frames per second camera. But even that hardly caught the moment. But look at it frame by frame, and you'll begin to see what's happening. First, the kernel expands. This is because the water inside the kernel has reached 200 degrees Celsius and has turned to steam. That steam then cooks the starch, which expands in three one-thousandths of a second, splits the kernel and puffs up into those little white clouds we love so much. So there you have it. Popcorn at a thousand frames a second. Before we end, there'll be tennis in the test department. Talking fridges in Germany. I have 
ordered some more milk. But first, Lefty Racehorses. <laughs> Apart from a certain black beer, the Irish are probably most famous for their horses. Sales of racehorses alone have topped £100 million in the past few years. And Irish horses won no less than 30 of the world's top races. But why is that? Well, there's lots of reasons, but Experimental has travelled to Limerick to check out just one. This is, I think, going right-handed. No, no, no. Huh? no, I think he's a left-handed horse, not it? He's won three races on right-handed tracks, and that's it. I'm sticking by my opinion, whatever you want to do. That's right. There's a strong belief amongst racegoers that horses are either left or right-handed, footed or hoofed. A fact that could give them the edge on some courses. But is it true? One man who thinks it is, is researcher Jack Murphy of the University of Limerick. It's well known for a long time by trainers and riders in particular that some horses tend to perform better while galloping on what we call or working on what we call the left or the right canter lead. They tend to prefer working to the left or the right. Jack's problem is taking this racecourse tale and turning it into scientific fact. And that's when he encountered his first hurdle. All right then, Tango, here's the piece of chalk. Write your name. Yet horses can neither write their name or pick up the chalk. However, Jack realised that the simple observational test that works so well with humans was a key to determining the handedness or hoofness of horses. Well, typically what we did, we devised the experiments around almost everyday occurrences, things that the horses might do almost every day, so that we would see what preferences the horses demonstrated. The first was watching the horse starting to walk. Did the horse initiate walk with either the left or the right front leg? So the second test then was conducted in an alleyway along which in the middle of was an obstacle where they had to go either to the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the obstacle to exit the alleyway. Another issue was when the horse got down to roll. Very often after exercise, horses get down to roll and when they get down, they would roll either to the left or to the right. After studying the preferences of hundreds of horses, there was no doubt that some were indeed left hoofers, while others trotted to the right. Apart from perhaps giving punters the edge at the bookies, the real benefit of Jack's research comes in training horses, particularly show jumpers, who need to be as happy jumping from the left as to the right. Knowing that a horse has a bias to one side or another means that trainers can devise exercises to compensate producing a horse that is, to use the lingo, straight. Having checked out hundreds of horses for their left and right-handedness, Jack realised there may be another indicator to that bias, quite literally staring him in the face. What we looked at were the facial hair whirls. And as you can see here on this horse, on Tango, Tango here has a clockwise facial hair whirl. And this is a female horse, and this mare, when we tested her, was very much right-sided. On the other hand, when you look at Calentra, this male horse here, this horse here has a counterclockwise facial hair whirl, and when we tested that horse, that horse was very left-sided. It seems that hair walls develop in the foetus around the same time as the brain. <sighs> Get a counterclockwise wall, and there's a strong probability that the horse will be left-handed. <coughs> Interestingly, a left or right-handed wall indicated another trait. We found that male horses typically were tended to be more left-sided, and conversely, the female horses tended to be more right-sided. But there is still one question not answered by Experimental's trip to Limerick. Should you call a horse left-handed or left-hoofed? Well, the technical term for left-handedness is sinistrality. Sinistral is left-hand, dextral is right-handed. But in, in horses, of course, we talk about left-sided or right-sided. I think we'll stick with calling you a left hoofer. <laughs> Finally on Experimental, the beer mat that thinks. But first, let's play some tennis at the test department. They're playing table tennis down at the test department. But it's not a contest. This is a scientific investigation. They're trying to work out why Billy Bunter cannot hit the ball. Is it his eyesight? Well, no. 
Perhaps a larger racket would help. Or maybe even a ball. Nope, not even that. It seems that the cause of Billy's inability to win a point is far more fundamental. Time for some physical measurements. According to the latest theories, Billy Bunter's reactions can be divided into two parts. First, there's a physical side, the time it takes for the signals to get from Billy's eyes to his brain. And then from his brain to his arms. These signals travel at around 120 metres per second. So in Billy's case, it takes approximately 13 milliseconds for the muscles to get the message. Those times are pretty much fixed for everybody. What makes Billy so bad at hitting the ball is the time he takes to think about what to do. Hi. Top players can work out the speed and direction of a ball earlier and with less information than it takes the average player, or even slow ones like Billy. <laughs> to end with, let's meet Robert Dürr, a truly great scientist based in Germany. He knew he was a whiz kid, but what he needed was a great idea to focus his whiz on. He tried the bath technique, where Archimedes had his eureka moment, but no. He stood under a lot of apple trees for that Newton moment, but it was the wrong season. But then he's into embedded technology, not botany, so we can't blame him for his arboreal ignorance. But then it happened. He had his moment, and it was in a bar. From now on, his whiz would be focused on how to get beer into his glass in the most technically efficient way. Robert works in a computer lab at the University of Saarland, where they work on embedded technology, the idea of making everyday things intelligent. Imagine a house door that can recognise you and let you in when you return home. A fridge that knows the use-by date of all the food you put into it. I have ordered some more milk. coffee machine that switches itself on when it hears you coming. A plant that tells you when it needs watering. Yes. Or a sofa that recognises your bum and switches on your favourite TV programme. Pretty cool, huh? Well, how about a wardrobe that listens to the weather forecasts? Today it will be raining. That is the wonder of embedded technology. But how does Robert hope it's going to revolutionise the world of beer drinking? Well, it's all in the beer mat. The weight of the full glass is conveyed, via a traditional beer mat, to a metal plate. Built-in electronics measure the weight and transmit the data to a receiver, which activates a signal indicating where the empty glasses are. The idea is that the mat monitors the level of the drinker's glass, sends a signal back to the bar staff, who can offer a refill before the drinker even knows he wants one. As you can see, it's very effective. Probably a little too effective. Which is why Robert wants to modify it so that future models might even be able to detect when a customer is in need of sobering up. Changing the order appropriately. <laughs> <laughs>